Let's stand. Chorus number 335. Just the chorus. second verse let's get around yes let's get around and welcome each other this morning
and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Well, it's good to see you back. Since we had to uh, kind of not be here last week due to weather uh, problems, but it's good to see you back in the Lord's house. And we've looked forward to this day to be able to fellowship one with another and see you guys once again. So it's good to see you. Appreciate you coming out. And uh, we're just going to have a wonderful time in the house of the Lord. And uh, we hope that you've been praying for this day and uh, hope that you're ready to receive the Word of God. That's why we're here, and uh, thank you guys so much for being in your place. Number 172. <clears throat> Tell me the story of Jesus.
going to sing a <clears throat> new song this morning that uh, practiced it a few times for uh, last Sunday because I was supposed to sing last Sunday, and uh, then I looked at the schedule this morning, and it said uh, men's group, so I didn't want to throw Jeff, and uh looks like Kyle wasn't worried about it anyway, so I didn't want to throw them under the bus and say, hey, guys, so... <clears throat> This is uh, a song that's really got a uh, tremendous meaning to it if you really just listen to the words. The title of the song is Worth It. Just just listen to the words. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll get choked up. Because as I heard this song several months ago, I ordered the CD and and, uh, no, can't sing that, can't sing that, but, uh, hopefully the Lord has, uh, got it here for a reason this morning. Just listen to the words. Are we worth it? the splendor of heaven, a crown, a robe, and a throne. So what kind of love would lead you to leave? Said I wasn't going to do this, Chris, but start over, please. Music up just a tad. This is one of those that if you miss that very first, you're off the rest of it and you can't catch up or, but it's important. Otherwise, wouldn't be here this morning. <clears throat>
I'm just so glad that somehow you thought I was worth it. But I'm just so glad that somehow you thought I was several people or a group of people, what is, in your opinion, the Lord known for? Many of you could say, well, He's known for saving my soul, which, which is a good deal. Which is why we're here to hear uh, the uncompromised message of the Lord. Some of you might say, well, the, the Lord is known for the mighty miracles that He done in, in our Scriptures. And certainly, who doesn't enjoy reading the miracles that we find in the Gospels' accounts? And as a matter of fact, if to be honest with you, who doesn't enjoy reading the miracles in the Old Testament as well that uh, the Lord is certainly responsible for? So, if I were to ask you individually, what is the Lord known for? Uh, no doubt some of you would have uh, uh, different ideas about that. But I want to focus on something today that sometimes it gets lost in the process. What is the Lord known for? In these last several weeks, we've been going over a series called The Essentials. Many of you will remember this. And this morning, the essential that we're going to be looking at is called The Real Lord's Prayer. This is the real Lord's Prayer. As a matter of fact, um, when we get over to Matthew chapter 6, we find that familiar uh, prayer that we've all prayed and athletes pray before the ball games, Thy Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. But actually, that's not the Lord's Prayer. That is the model prayer or, if you want to be real technical, it was the disciples' prayer. So, we understand that and we look at the context of this, but we're going to show you something today that hopefully will encourage your hearts. Something that I think that will um, give you something to, to think about. So with all of that in mind, I'm going to invite your attention to something and as we look at, but before we do so, we're going to ask you to stand in reverence of the precious Word of God. We'll ask you to stand as we partake of the divine scriptures this morning. I want you to just stop right where you are. And I want you just to examine your life and those around you. But I just think that we need to pause just for a minute because, quite frankly, these last eight or nine days have been challenging for the most part. So, Miss Janice, I want you to come up here right quick. And I want you to play just something very soft, very smooth, very soothing. And I want us just to pray right now in our own hearts. And just give us a time to get prepared for the message. Amen, if we can do that. So wherever you are, whatever prayer need is, is in your life. Miss Janice is going to play softly. Let's just ask the Lord to do something this morning.
Father, we thank You for the moment that we have here this morning. Father, I know people have been challenged these last few days. and Father, we just want to push all of that aside and focus on the death, burial, and the resurrection. We want to focus on You, dear Lord. This is a moment in time that we set apart. That, Father, this is not about the preacher. This is not about me. This is about You. And, Father, my prayer is that when people leave this service, they can honestly say what a great God we have. And, Father, I just pray that You would impress it deep down in our hearts, the truths that we will discover today. And may we never soon forget these things we'll discuss. Father, I pray that You purge me from self and sin. Allow me to preach the Word that's been studied. And, Father, I thank You again for all that You're going to do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated if you would. Thank you, Miss Janice. You might be surprised to know that great Bible teachers of the past hesitated to preach on our subject matter. Let me give you this. In John chapter 17, we find the Lord's Prayer. And it is such a holy moment in the Lord's life that many of our forefathers would not preach on this chapter. It has been recorded that some of the Puritans were known to preach from John 16 and John 18, but only read John 17 reverently. If you are familiar with your Bibles, then you know the context of John chapter 17. On the night of the last earthly life of Jesus here on earth, He and His disciples are in the upper room. And all four Gospel writers record this event, but only John gives us more of the actual details. In order to know what is happening, I want to go back a little bit and bring you up to speed. In John chapter 13, Jesus arrives at the upper room where He washed the disciples' feet and gave them an example of servanthood. Then in John 14, Jesus tells these men not to let their hearts be troubled. And in John 15 and 16, Jesus speaks these words as He walks towards the city gate, leading down into the Kidron Valley and into the Garden of Gethsemane. John 17 is where Jesus prays for His disciples. Now, I want you to get this. Jesus prays for His disciples, but He also prays for you. Now, wait a minute. I want you to hear that. Jesus prays for you. In John 17, is a prayer of Jesus that He offered in the darkness before He reaches the Garden of Gethsemane. John records for us Jesus' words in the most humble of prayers. In John 17, 1 through 5, Jesus prays for Himself. And in verses 6 through 26, He prays for His disciples and He prays for you. Now, some of you that are hearing this might be surprised by that. But you shouldn't, because I want to tell you this. I want to give you some good news this morning. Jesus prays for you. I can prove that, as a matter of fact. Now, if you will, go to John chapter 17, and we're going to pick apart some of these verses. And I hope that you leave here encouraged in a deeper understanding of your relationship with the Lord. John chapter 17 and verse number 9. Let's look at this. John 17 and verse number 9. Look what Jesus, matter of fact, this is Jesus' own words. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them that thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now I want you to catch the words, I pray for them. That the context tells us that Jesus is praying for his disciples, but there's a broader application as well. Personally, we could infer that those in Christ are His disciples and that the Lord is praying for you directly. Our Lord has an intercessory ministry, which means this, that He prays for you, that He prays for you, that He prays for you, that He prays for you. Now, I don't know about you, but somebody will get a little excited about that this morning. Let me prove something to you. Notice, if you will, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 34. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 34. <clears throat> Paul writes, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, now watch this. 
Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God. Now watch. Who also maketh intercession. Underscore these two words. For, watch, us. Now, by the way, if you are a born-again Christian this morning, guess what? You are an us. Praise the Lord. You are an us. He makes intercession for you. He intercedes for you. He intercedes for your needs. He intercedes when He sees you uh, falling. He intercedes when you're not getting everything that you need to understand. Christ intercedes for you. Somebody, amen. He has an intercessory ministry. Now, wait a minute. Here's what you're thinking already. Well, you're a bozo. No, no, wait a minute. Come on. How can Christ intercede for us when there's six to eight billion people here on the earth? Well, let me just give you this. If God can speak the world into existence, I will assure you that He can intercede for you. Now, I don't know about you, but this is just... Listen, we ain't even got to the good part yet. That's already good. Amen? Now, when I think about this, it just blows my mind. He prays for us. So Jesus comes to the rescue when the devil tries to slander and accuse us. It's, it's like this. Now watch this. The devil comes to, uh, to God the Father and says something like this. Well, I just want to tell you something about old Mac McLeod. He ain't worth a dime. Did you see his thought life this week? Did you see what he did this week? I guarantee, this is the devil speaking. The devil said, instead of him picking up his Bible, he just flipped on that TV over and over and over, and he claims to be one of yours. Jesus stands up alongside and says, Mr. Devil, Mac McLeod is my child. You leave him alone. I got him. And I want to tell you, Mr. Devil, He's mine. And I know Mac McLeod. I know who he is. And I know what he's doing. So, Mr. Devil, you back off. Think about that, my friend. Wow! In other words, Jesus is our defense attorney pleading our cause. Wow! Woo this just gets better and better as, as we get into this. Now, I want you to think about this. Uh, he prays for us. Let me give you an example of something that I want you to see. So kind of put all this in perspective. In John chapter 6, the disciples were in the boat on the Sea of Galilee when a huge storm come up. You know this story. But where was Jesus? Now, wait, wait, everybody look up here. Let me just see your interest. The storm came up and the disciples were more than scared. But Jesus wasn't with them in the boat. He was on the mountain. And guess what Jesus was doing? He was texting. He's looking at his Facebook account. Seeing how many likes he got. No. Jesus was praying. Jesus left his mountain. Went down to the water. Stepped into those stormy waves. Walked to his men in the disturbed ways because he knew where they were. Even though he wasn't in the boat with them, he had been watching over them with prayer. Even when they could not see him, he saw them. That, my friend, is a role of Christ Jesus in the believer's life. As each of us look over our lives, if we were honest we'd realize how God's hand has protected us from many terrible accidents that could have come our way. Now, I want to tell you this. It doesn't take a genius to know this. Some of you would not be here this morning if it had not been for God's protected hand. Some of you have gone through accidents. You've gone through perils. You've gone through situations and you're sitting here this morning and you're saying this, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would have had no hope. Thank God for that. You know why? Because He watches over you. Wow. Something that's hard to understand is this. When the Holy Spirit has done all He could do to keep you out of trouble... And the Word of God has done all it can do. There is still more. 
Up in heaven next to the Father is my Savior praying for me. Up in heaven is our Savior praying for you. Up in heaven is Jesus looking down and says, I've got your back. I got you. And I know where you are. Let me show you something in Psalm chapter 121, verse number 2. Psalm chapter 121 and verse number 2. Look at this first. Look, you, you got to mark this. Look at this first phrase. My help cometh from the Lord. Amen. Which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Amen. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day. Nor the noon, uh, no, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. Look at this. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth. And watch this. And even for evermore. Can I tell you something I read this last week? You might as well say yes. I'm going to tell you anyway. Did you realize when we get to heaven, there'll be no need of prayer because we're going to be right there with Him. Right there with Him. You know what that word evermore means? Watch this. Watch. He watches over me now. And when I'm in glory, He'll still watch over me. Now think about it. You get a double dose. We just to get this. Watch. We get to experience a little bit of heaven right here on earth. And you just don't even know that. Well, preacher, you don't understand. My life is so difficult. My life is so crummy. Nobody understands. I go through this and I go through this now. But you need to stop and understand this. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't even be here this morning. If it wasn't for His protection, you could be in the hospital. If it wasn't for your protection, your protection, you could be in the morgue this morning. I'm telling you, there's something to praise the Lord about. Somebody needs to get a hold of that. Something needs to get a hold of that. He intercedes for you and He intercedes for me. Notice John chapter 17, verse number 15. Again, this is our Lord's prayer right before, certainly he, He's right before He's crucified. Watch this. I pray not, watch, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from now, notice how he says this. The evil. By the way, if you take taking notes, the word evil is simply, is simply referring to Satan. Satan is the accuser of the Christian. Which is one of the reasons why Jesus prays for our protection. Can you imagine that? Jesus prays for your protection. Let me show you something. Let me give you an example of this. Now, I want you to tune in with me and, and zero in on this. In Luke chapter 22, verse number 31, I want you to see something because I think this will help you. Luke chapter 22, verse number 31. Uh, Christ again is speaking and He's talking to Peter, but look what He says. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desire to have you. Wow. Underscore that. Satan wanted Peter. That he may sift you as wheat. Ah, look, 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 look. But I have prayed. Guys, don't miss that. But I have prayed. By the way, who's he praying for? He's praying for Peter. But I have prayed, Peter. Watch. That thou faith fail not without converted, converted strength in thy brethren. Now, Satan's target was Peter and Jesus assured His disciple that He would not be alone. He told Peter that He was praying for His faith not to fail. But here's what you and I know. But you say, preacher, Peter's faith did fail. But can I tell you, that was not the end of the story. After the resurrection of Jesus, Peter returned to the Lord. In other words, in response to Jesus' prayer, God allowed Satan to test Peter but Peter came back stronger and served the Lord and even died for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you what happened? Jesus prayed for Peter. 
I want you to clear this, everything out of your mind. I want you to hear this. If Peter can get prayed for by our Lord, guess who else can get prayed for? Now, see, you, 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 you hadn't even thought about that this week. You, you hadn't even thought about the Lord praying for you. Well, He's got so much to do. After all, He's got to clean up Washington. No, no, wait a minute. No, but one of His ministries is to pray for you. I, I, I just, listen, you, you just get to hear this today. I've had this ruminating on my mind for about three, four weeks. Jesus prays for me. And He prays for you. Shouldn't that make a difference in the way that you look at things? Shouldn't that make a difference in some of your conduct? All right. Let's go on. Let me show you something. Something that's very interesting in John chapter 17 and verse number 13. Wow. Don't miss this. And now I come... Now watch. And now come I to thee. And these things speak, I speak in the world that they might, ha now watch, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now I don't know about you, but this just, when I saw this, a big bell went off in my mind. Watch this. Jesus, come on, watch. Everybody look, everybody, whoa, it's not time to sleep yet. Come on, everybody look, everybody look. Jesus is praying for your joy. Ah, Shelby told me something this morning. I got joy over what she told me. Tremendous joy. And I can think, if Jesus is praying for our joy, you know what? We should hook on to that joy train. Come on now. You at least can smile for crying out loud. We ought to hook on to that. And no one... Jesus, wait, 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 let's back up. Jesus is fixing to die for me. He's fixing to die for the world, and He's talking about joy. Now, what's the deal with that? Because I want to tell you, Jesus not only was a man acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53 tells us, but He also was a man acquainted with joy. And right before He's going to die for the sins of the world, He decides to pray for our joy. Good night! Pray for our joy. What about that sourpuss I live with? What about that co-worker? Well, by the way, if Jesus prays for our joy, would it not hurt to pray for others? Joy? Wow. By the way, can I give you something else? Look at John 15, 11, just to piggyback on that. Again, Jesus is marching toward the cross and He says these words, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy... Look at this. I, I, I'm not even making this up. That your joy might be... Cool. Let me ask you this. Has your joy meter been lately? Oh, preacher, for crying out loud, it was cold. Roads were bad. People were just all over the place. Going to the grocery store and all of that. So you can't tell. I'm just telling you what Jesus says. That your, by the way, when he says your, why don't you put your name there? That Bernie's joy might be full. That Pop's joy might be full. That Court's joy might be full. Is anybody getting this? Now, wait a minute. It's easy to say that on good days. Jesus is fixing to go die for the sins of the world. It's amazing. It's amazing. There at the end of His life, He's praying for our joy. Wow. Wow. Notice John 17, 17, we're winding down. 
this is something that I really wanted you to see, and, and I hope I can spend a, just a minute here. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I want you to see the word them in that verse. Jesus is praying, now watch, that we will be a holy people. Jesus is asking the Father to take this truth and change our life. Jesus is praying for each of us to grow out of our fears, our addictions, and our immaturity. As we read and study, Jesus is praying for our hearts to understand His truth. Now watch this. And be changed by it. Something that came to my attention was this. And I want, I want everybody to answer this in your heart. Are you ready? Here's a question. Not, not out loud, but just, just a question. How many of you have actually... Let, 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 let's just use the last four weeks. How many of you have actually been changed by a truth that you encountered through the Word of God? I'm, I'm talking about changed by the truth. I'm not talking about underlining it in your, in your Bible saying, wow, that's pretty good. I'm talking about you found something and it changed your life. It changed your thinking. It's changed a behavior that you were engaged in. How many of you have done that? That's exactly what Jesus is praying here. Sanctify them. Set them apart through thy truth. He says, Change them through the truth, O oh God. When they encounter this, let them embrace it, but let them change their behavior. Let them change their outlook on life. Let me ask you this. Has the Word of God ever changed you? What about last week? Can I tell you, describe something about last week? Just say yes. Okay, you're going to hear it anyway. Last week is like right before the Super Bowl. The coach tells his star player, you can't play in the game. Right before the World Series, manager comes and says, star pitcher, we're not even going to pitch you in the series. That's what it felt like to this preacher last week. I wanted to hear God's truth. I wanted to be in the church of the living God and be around our people and see your faces. Well, maybe, but see your faces. And be able to show you this truth. Jesus says, now watch, Jesus is praying that the truth will change your life. That's amazing. What, what are you talking about? That means that if you get a hold of this, something's not going right in your life, you need to let the Word of God change your behavior. Notice John seventeen twenty four. Father, I will that they also... Now watch this. Whom Thou hast given Me, this is absolutely incredible. Watch. Be with Me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which Thou hast given me. For Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. As people of faith, we always talk about our goal is to be with Jesus one day. But here, Jesus prays about His desire to be with us. Really? Wait a minute, did anybody get that but me? You see, we always say, I want to be with Jesus. Jesus is praying, I want to be with you. That changes the whole dynamic. That changes everything. He wants to come, us to come to Him. He is praying for us to be with Him so that we can see Him in glory. <laughs> this prayer is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It ought to change you when you walk out of this room. It ought to get you to understand that this thing about Christianity is not just put it on when you feel like it. It's not just dabble in it when you have nothing else to do. No, no, no. This thing about having a new relationship with Christ is in a covenant relationship. In other words, you say, Lord, I am yours. 
total me. I don't just, I'm not just the Lord's when I feel like it. I'm not just with the Lord when I don't have anything else to do. No, 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 no. This thing about a relationship with Christ is all consuming. It's a 24 hours a day relationship. It's not that, watch this, it's not just on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. No, 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 no. This thing is every day of your life. And Jesus is saying, I pray to be with you. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. Can you imagine that? The Father of all creation. The one that held the world in His hands. The one who formed and fashioned this whole galaxy and threw it into space is now saying, I want to be with you. But the question always comes back is this. What's your desire for Him? What's your desire for Him? I wonder, and this is it, I wonder this. What happens if there was a way that we could ask Jesus a question and we could have His undivided attention for just 24 hours? Just suppose that Jesus could come and in, 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 in our minds and He could just sit right here in this chair. And we'd have him for 24 hours and ask him anything. Ask him anything. Why? All of our why questions. I don't have any of those. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Everybody in here has a why question. We could ask him that. You know what I got to thinking the other day? It doesn't matter if Jesus answered all of our why questions, because we would still not make sense of it. And that's the reason why we are Christians by faith and not by sight. And that's the reason why we just trust Him every single day. When the roads get icy, we trust Him. When things get out of shape, we, we, we trust Him. When the doctor calls and gives us that report, guess what? Come on, come on. Guess what? We trust Him. When it didn't make sense financially in our home, guess what we do? We trust Him. Jesus is saying all in John chapter 17, it boils down to this. I pray for you. Now, if He prays for us, it also means He must love us a great deal. You know what I found out in my life? It is hard to pray for somebody you don't like. Come on. It is very hard to pray for someone you don't like. I'm not saying you, you can't do it. It's just harder. So that means, since Jesus prays for us, He sure must love us. And you know what? A lot of times we don't give Him much to love. God commended His love toward us. And that why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. And He says, I love you and I pray for you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? The ultimate question that when we come to a service like this, and the ultimate question we must ask ourselves is this. Are we in the place where God would have us to be? Are we spiritually doing those things that we ought to do? We talked about God loving us and God wanting to be with us and God wanting us to be changed by His truth. But my friend, all of these words will be just empty words if we don't just act upon them this morning. You see, the devil wants you... What, he he don't mind you hearing these these things. He just don't want you to act upon these things. I'm challenging you this morning. Could there be one person in this room that has just been so hungry to sense the presence of God in their life once again? 
you bounced around, you, you thought this, you've been here, you've done this, but nothing is ever satisfied. But I'm telling you, when you have that commitment to Christ, when you know that you're in the center of His will, when you know that you're doing all that, that you can possibly do, and God is blessing your life, and He's praying for you, and He loves you, then it just is a change in relationship. How many of you would say, Preacher, I long for that kind of life. I long for that kind of intimacy with Christ. It seems like it's been so empty in my life lately. I've not experienced anything that you've talked about this morning. Number one, do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you been truly born again by the blood of Christ? Number two, are you sharing those things daily? Are you with that relationship with the Lord? Do you speak to Him? Do you read His Word? Do you ask Him? Lord, teach my heart. But is there a block? Is there some pet sin that you have been fostering? That's been stored up in your heart for a long time? Maybe you've been playing with it lately. Maybe you stroke it every now and then. Maybe you take it out in the open. Maybe you hide it from whoever. Now it's time to be the people God wants us to be. Father, whoever may need this message watching through Facebook Live or whoever may need it in this room, I pray that You would convict them such that they would do something with this message. Not just leave it. Not just dismiss it. But Father, actually do something with the truth. Would you stand with me all over the room? Would you ask God's blessing on this word that you heard? And if you need to respond accordingly, would you do so? Brother Randy, if you would.